Variety Weekly News Podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Variety Weekly News Podcast, also known as BWN Podcast. My name is Rodney Bridey. I am your host. And this week we have a great interview. Uh, our guest is Dr. Carol Williams, doctor of veterinary medicine. She is a veterinarian. She was gracious enough to spend time with us and answer questions and tell us about her profession. And all I can say is I have my contacts in, so I'm feeling good. Other than that, here we go. Dr. Carol Williams, doctor of veterinary medicine. All right, Dr. Carol Williams, doctor of veterinary medicine. Thank you for joining us uh, here on Variety Weekly News Podcast. And I asked you to be on the show just because I always want to speak with people with interesting jobs or interesting lives. And veterinary medicine seems to be something that not a lot of people know a lot about and even how to become a veterinarian. So I do appreciate you coming here and spending time with us and giving us your information. Now, I personally, I went to school, college for seven years. Uh, I did not enjoy the process at all. I know veterinary school is very rigorous. Um, how did you feel about going to school and becoming a veterinarian? Yes, vet- veterinary school is pretty rigorous. It takes about um, eight years, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more uh, after high school to become a veterinarian. Personally, for me, I absolutely loved it. I loved my time both in undergrad and in veterinary school. Uh, but I will say by the time, you know, my my seventh year of college, that was, uh, I was I was just about ready to put down the books and get into the clinics. So could you tell us what the actual process of becoming a veterinarian is? Uh, when did you decide you wanted to be a veterinarian? What types of classes did you take? And, you know, how did you go about reaching to your dreams? So veterinary medicine is a pretty small profession. Um, there, when I was in vet school, there were only about 28 schools in the nation. Now I think there's about 40 schools, so uh, it's a very small community. Um, not too many people get in. But the, so most people find out about the profession because their parents, for example, were, were veterinarians. And so maybe they dreamt of being a veterinarian their whole life as a little kid. Um, but but I was an exception. I didn't know anything about veterinary medicine when I was a child. Um, I didn't know any veterinarians. But I did know that I loved watching Animal Planet, uh, the Discovery Channel, anything that I could find out about animals, I was fascinated by it. And so I went to college and studied animal sciences, thinking maybe I want to be a zookeeper or a wildlife photographer or something like that. But once I started taking uh, all those chemistry classes that are required, I was like, man, this is so hard. Somebody better call me doctor by the end of it. So, <laughs> so I was like, hey, why not become an animal doctor? And so it was in vet school that I started looking into veterinary medicine and what it is. Um, and through that, I was able to find out about all different t- fields of, of the veterinary profession, meet some veterinarians, uh, get some experience, uh, and then I went for it. So it's about four years of undergrad. Uh, some people can finish all of the required classes in about three years, but most people get the full d- four-year bachelor's degree, and then vet school in the United States is another four years, so about eight years total. You said in the United States. Uh, can you go to vet school out of the United States? And- yeah, definitely. So um, a lot of people will go to a lot of people in the U.S. will go to vet schools in the um, the Caribbean, like St. Kitts, um, and there's a couple more down in the islands, and then that that are accredited by accredited by the. AAVMC. That's the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. And then um, those degrees automatically transfer. There's also a lot of schools in Canada that we can go to, uh, the UK and Australia. Both have prestigious schools. And then other people go to schools in all the other countries in the world, but then you have to do like a rigorous program um, application and testing to get your degree to transfer so that you can practice in the United States. So, so yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, so everybody who goes to veterinary school, do they learn the same things or depending on the vet, vet school you go to, do you learn different things? 
Well, I mean, for the most part, we basically all learn the same things. You have the option to sort of tailor your education at, at, at the different schools in the United States somewhat, but we, we all have to learn the basics about most different most of the species of the animals especially to pass our board exam at the end um, of the four-year veterinary degree program uh, the postgraduate program to become board certified you have to take the test which is called the NAVLI it's the national board exam and it covers all the species of animals so so you're saying yeah. any veterinarian I talk to can do surgery on animals they've been trained to do a surgery on animals any vet, yeah, every every veterinarian you you've talked to you can talk to has been trained to do basic surgery. Um, That's amazing. But you know, <laughs> some veterinarians haven't done it in years, and they may not still be doing it. But yeah, we've all received the basic training, and then other people, some a few of of the veterinarians go on and do additional training. Um, and become board certified surgeons so they specialize in surgery and then the, you know they can they can do all the different types of surgeries on animals for the most part that surgeons do on humans so it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because you know a lot of people i think they don't necessarily understand the full scope of being a veterinarian so when you tell people you're a veterinarian what do most people think you do i would say when when i so on the on the rare occasion that I tell people that I'm a veterinarian, most people will immediately start talking to me about their dogs and cats at home and asking me about the different diseases they have or symptoms and what should they do. Uh, so yeah, I would say the vast majority of people just assume that I... Uh, am a small animal practitioner, maybe own my own practice and take care of dogs and cats. Could you could you explain that a little more? You said small animal practitioner. What's what are, what is the category? Okay. So some broad categories are small animals, which basically is dogs and cats, large animals, which is like uh the the f- farm animals, horses, um cattle, sheep, goats, Etc. Then there's the poultry veterinarians who focus on um, chickens and turkeys, bird, like food birds, uh, ducks, etc. And then the exotic veterinarians who may focus on pocket pets like ferrets and um, rodents or even birds, um, and the, and then also zoo animals as well. Zoo animal. Okay. All right. So or wildlife, yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you want to go into, um, you know, small animal cats and dogs and things like that, do you just jump into it? Do you just apply for a clinic, um, or is there some kind of tra- extra training you have to do to to do that? So, in um, in vet school, you have two to three years of classes, typically book learning. And then one to two years of dedicated time in rotations where you're in clinics or you go out on externships. And so during that time, when you're on rotation, you are are practicing with, with the different species or different categories, um, large animal or small animal. So when you graduate, you can just start basically with whatever, you know, whichever type you want. Yeah. Now, okay, so let's say I want to I w- want to work in a zoo. A lot of people they love going to the zoo. They want to hang out in a zoo. What's the process of becoming a zoo vet? Okay, I was thinking of becoming a zoo vet, and I actually got some experience before vet school, working in a zoo, thinking I was going to take that path. But since there are so few zoos and so many so few positions for veterinarians in zoos, um, and so many people want to do the job, it's extremely competitive. So while all the veterinarians have been trained to on on the basics of figuring out how to treat all the different kinds of species of animals, um, and we could all basically probably start off becoming a zoo veterinarian, the competition is so great that it has pushed it to the point where veterinarians have to go above and beyond to become 
to gain those open positions. So you have to first do an internship after you graduate school. Actually, you have to do research even before that. While you're in vet school, you have to make a lot of connections, networking, go to different conferences, start working on research for exotic animals, and get your scientific studies published. And then um, do an internship after veterinary school, which is like an intense year, one year of practicing with specialized um, veterinarians who will teach you and the caseload is really high and the idea is that you see enough patients within one year to be equivalent of gaining the experience in regular practice over a three-year period. Wow. Yeah and so in the internship usually that's you're just seeing dogs and cats at a, a referral center. And for so that, those are for the really difficult cases uh, that regular private practitioners can't figure out on their own, and they refer it to the specialist, um, internal medicine specialist or surgeon, etc. And then after that one year of intense internship, you have to do about a four-year, three to four-year residency if you get accepted to it. And it's very difficult to get accepted to it. And the residencies are f with zoos and aquariums. So I know, I'm from Chicago, and um, in, ch in Chicago they have a residency between the Shedd Aquarium there and the Lincoln Park Zoo and the, the Brookfield Zoo. And so the, the veterinarian who's on residency there is rotating between those three locations over the three or four year, I think it's four year period. Um, and so if you've done enough research and made enough connections and got high enough grades, etc., got accepted to your inter internship, did, were really successful, and you're lucky enough to be that one person who gets the residency in Chicago, <laughs> then you become, you can work towards getting board certified. And you do, you finish that residency, and then there's this, ex, like, extremely difficult long test. I think it's, I'm like, I, I haven't done it, I don't, and, but I, I think usually the board certification tests are, like, eight-hour long exams or more. So, yeah, yeah it's kind it, of intense. It's intense. Uh, you it's gotta have intense. some dedication. Yeah, very similar to the human medical profession, the, the steps to go through it. So, yeah, and then if you finally get all of that, you get board certified in... Zo uh, exotic medicine, zoologic medicine, um, then you have to find a position open in either in the United States or be willing to travel. Uh, like I know a veterinarian who was working really hard when, when I worked at the Lincoln Park Zoo. She was the resident there, and the job opening that she finally found was all the way in New Zealand. So she she got up and left. Now she lives in New Zealand. <laughs> and that's not a bad place to be, I guess, right? Oh, so, yeah. So I wanted to be a zoo vet, but you have to be willing to just move wherever the job opening is and put in all those years of hard work, dedication, and have low pay for, the, for that. Yeah. It's pretty tough. So you said you wanted to be a zoo vet, but uh, you ended up not taking that path. So what is your experience? What experiences have you had working as a veterinarian after school, what what kind of fields did you work in? Okay. Yeah, so I've kind of been bouncing around all over the place, especially since I found out about the profession late in life. I've kind of been open-minded to all kinds of experiences and just wanting to try to see all there is that this profession can give me. So um, while I was in vet school, I worked towards getting a master's degree in public health. So I learned about how veterinarians can affect the health of populations, both human and, han and animal populations. And I focused on zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that people share with animals. Um, lest we forget that, anim that humans are also animals. So, uh, so, yeah, most people don't take that into account. But, yeah, we do share a lot of diseases um, as well as how food animals and the health of those animals can affect people um, once they enter the food supply. And 
So I kind of focused on all of those things in vet school. And then after veterinary school, I decided to try private practice for a while. I went to a mixed animal practice, which is uh, where you see basically everything. And it was a small practice out in the country in southern Illinois. And I saw all the kinds of animals that you could think of. I saw mostly dogs, cats but also a lot of cows, cattle, um, a few horses, a lot of sheep and goats, and then a few random animals, some chickens. Uh, we had a zoo come through one time, um, and it was like a little traveling zoo. And so I had to check the, the health papers and kind of examine them all, them all and make sure that their, their papers were good to travel into our state, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, a few pocket pets, exotic animals. So I, I did that for a while. But so you worked in Southern Illinois, mixed practice. Mm -hmm. And how long did you do that, do that for? And then what made you decide, you know, maybe try something different? So I did that for about a year. And I decided I wanted to move closer to uh, the city, most closer to where my family lived. And while I, I still wanted to work with... The farm animals there, it's just, it's way too cold in Wisconsin for me. So I i switched and did small animal practice for a while. Worked with dogs and cats. Did that for a few years. And now I work with the government. Um, back to working with food animals, cows and pigs. Um, cattle, pigs, sheep, goats. But this time, what I do is I supervise food inspectors, and I also check that um, the animals are healthy and safe enough to enter a food supply and won't spread any diseases to, to people who eat them. So if they're not healthy, what's the process of getting rid of them? Or what do you, what do, you do when an animal is not healthy? How do you stop them from getting their food supply? So I'm, I'm actually on the front line of making sure that foreign animal diseases, diseases from other countries that can be devastating to our food supply, don't make it into the country. So I'm looking at the animals while they're alive, making sure they look nice and healthy. If they have symptoms that I suspect are, uh, that they might have certain types of diseases like mad cow disease, or tuberculosis, or foreign animal disease, like foot and mouth disease, um, that can affect either human health or just the health of all the populations of the animals, then I get in contact, I, I hold, I retain those animals and start the process of testing, tracing back um, to where they came from um, so we can, t you know, detect the diseases and isolate them and keep them under control before they spread. So that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is <laughs> basically yeah, see, keeping so, everybody in so the United I States alive. Them before they die. And if, if I suspect something, then the process starts there. I hold them there. Some diseases you can't tell until after they've already been slaughtered. And so once the animal has been harvested, I will check the insides to, to look, basically do like an, an autopsy for animals, which is called a necropsy. So I'll do the postmortem exam as well. Uh, based on the way you tell me, I mean, veterinarians basically can work in a lot of different fields and do multiple different things. They're just trained to work everywhere and do anything. <laughs> Whether they're cutting an animal up to save its life or checking the meat I'm going to eat after I grill it on my steak. I mean, veterinarians have been trained and can do so many things. Yeah, that, that's one thing I love about the veterinary degree. It's so adaptable um, because we have to work with so many different species of animals and basically become a doctor of like countless types of different animals. Um, we... and. To treat them, we often have to use tools, whatever is available to us at the time, uh, and be able to adapt to, between, you know, the smallest little mouse 
or hamster and then also go and treat an elephant. We have to learn how to adapt to all those different situations or figure out how to do surgery on a fish. <laughs> Keeping the body outside of the water while their gills are underneath the water. Our, the way we learn in school about how having to be able to adapt to so many different unpredictable situations, that makes us prepared to handle a wide variety of situations uh, and professions at work as well, which is great. So, so far I've had three or four different types of jobs. Um, I graduated about five years ago. And so, you know, my profession, my career, I'm sure, is going to continue to evolve. And uh, I have a lot of opportunities available to me. So that's, that's a, a huge benefit to having the, the veterinary degree. What, what would you say, would you say there's any difficulty or what the difficulty level is when it comes to transitioning from one job that is completely different to than the other one, the one you're going to? Well, whether you stay in your same job forever or you transition to different jobs, every day you're seeing something completely different because, um, like, let's say you, you, I stayed as a small animal dog and cat veterinarian my whole life. Every day, different animals are coming in with different diseases, different cancers, different presentations, and you have to continue to educate yourself and get continuing education and study and try to figure out what's going on so you know every day is a surprise and you're constantly learning so then you know if, if it doesn't take that much more to switch over to a different aspect a different type of job yeah so the the transition from working in the country and seeing farm animals to uh, working in the city and seeing dogs and cats to becoming a relief veterinarian and uh, just going into different practices when other vets are sick or you know need need a day off, covering for them, um, setting my own schedule that way. I did that for a while too. All of that adaptability for me, it, it wasn't. I don't, I don't think it's that difficult. And um, like I've heard of uh, other vets too, older veterinarians. Like um, there are some vets. I, I did some internships out in California, and there they have these huge dairy herds, and I'm talking like 20,000 cows on a farm, and the veterinarians will just focus on taking care of the, the those herds of dairy cattle, um, checking them to see if they're pregnant, and giving them vaccines, deworming, and and basically focusing on herd health giving recommendations to the businesses or the farmers about how to adjust the, the, the barns where the animals live to have better ventilation or to adjust their feed so you can kind of prevent some of the diseases looking at the health of the animals at a population scale. So I, I, I met a lot of veterinarians who do that and one of them, he just totally switched gears uh, he was about, he had been practicing doing those dairy, uh, as a dairy veterinarian for, I think, 15 years or so, and his arm was getting tired from the, the manual labor of working with the animals yeah. and doing the pregnancy checks and all of this, um, and so he wanted tra a transition, and he just applied to a government job and became a fish Inspector. All right. Yeah, it's, a huge thing. it's like 180 <laughs> and right there. he got it. And, you know, so he may not have looked at the anatomy of a fish in 20 years since he was in vet school. But, you know, he has the, back, the education and the ability to retrain his thoughts and adapt and be able to meet those needs. Yeah. Now, you said that. There were about 25 schools when you went to veterinary school. Um, can you speak about diversity in the veterinary practice? Since there's so few schools and there's so few people in each class, um, how, how do you view diversity and how does that affect uh, the veterinary practice and the profession? So the, the veterinary profession has tr transitioned a lot 
since the 1970s. It's got a really interesting background, actually. So, um, prior to the 1970s, the veterinary profession was basically almost all white men. And um, starting in the 70s, women started going to college to become veterinarians. And in the, in the 70s, the, tr the balance of the number of veterinarians who were men to women, um, the disparity started to close the gap between that. And I think maybe around the 80s, it started, it, the, the switch actually happened where more women started going to veterinary school than men. And that has continued all the way up until present day, which now, across all the veterinary schools, about 80% of the students in all of the veterinary schools are women, and only about 20% are men. Yeah, that's that's drastic. That's um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a huge transition. Some sociologists and other people are trying to study to figure out why that's happening. I think this is the only, um, you know, doctoral profession where that's happening that I know of, where it's now the profession is mostly women who are graduating rather than men. But that's an interesting dynamic. Um, and then as far as racial diversity and racial and ethnic diversity, that that transition hasn't actually happened yet. So um, the vet veterinary medical profession is consistently listed as one of the least racially and ethnic diverse professions out of the health professions like uh, medical doctor, dentist, pharmacist, etc. And even as well as the other professions like lawyer. Um, and there, it's definitely lagging behind. So I believe we're around maybe something like 90% of the profession is still Caucasian of veterinarians. And then the rest is non-Caucasian. So you actually started an organization called Multicultural Medical Veterinary Association to actually address the issues in the veterinary profession. Can you speak about that? Yeah, so a few years ago, I started a Facebook group called the Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association uh, just to see if I could get some interest in um, starting, officially starting the organization. When I was in vet school, in, in, in the school, in the college, there was a similar organization called VOICE, Veterinarians as One in Culture and Ethnicity, and I was associated with that. I became the national president of that, and so I knew a lot of veterinary students um, who were working towards increasing diversity within the veterinary profession, and um, what my experience working towards that as a student was that I, I felt like we needed some assistance from a veterinary association and at that time I didn't see the equivalent of, of the, the student version for graduated practicing veterinarians. I see. Yeah, so when I got out I started the Facebook group and we got quite a, quite a big following for our small profession. Um, and there was quite a bit of interest. And then recently, this past year, I got some founding members together, some other people who volunteered to help found the, the, the organization. And we started having regular meetings. And now we have an association since um, the fall of 2017. Well, that's that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we put on a few uh, events so far, some networking events. We're working towards uh, getting some speakers at different um, continuing education conferences and setting up networks. We work with the student organization, uh, Voice. Uh, we collaborate with them on getting some mentoring for them, helping the students find internships. Uh, and, yeah, so we're on our way. And currently 
we don't uh, like membership is is free we don't we don't have dues yet but uh we're we're a small organization and we're slowly growing so great anytime you want to plug your organization <laughs> so free. yeah look us up on facebook multicultural veterinary medical association mcvma mcvma burn that into your brain <laughs> now i know you spoke about this a little bit i just want to go back to this um Right now, there's a lot of discussion about uh, gender pay gap um, in the veterinary profession. Does that exist? Even I know you said there's 80 percent of the people in school are women, mm-hmm. but does a gender pay gap exist even with that fact? Yeah. So since the um, increase of veterinary women veterinarians has started happening back in the 70s. Now we're to the point where with most of the older veterinarians retiring and most of the younger veterinarians coming out are women, that the the whole profession is, is starting to be skewed towards more women veterinarians than male veterinarians. But despite that, there's still evidence that women are getting paid less and face the same types of discrimination that you see for um, in in any other profession in the United States, definitely. Hmm. What What do you think uh, can be done to address that and then change that? So, so how to change that is not really my area of specialty, but um, I'm kind of interested in it because, well, you hear about the Me Too movement going on now, which definitely affects the veterinary profession and um, a lot of organizations. Uh, excuse me. A lot of a lot of news broadcasting is talking about gender pay gap politics. You hear about that a lot. So um, I can tell you about my experience with it, rather than how to actually change it. Sure. But um, so, for example, at one of the places I worked at, I worked there for a while. I saw a lot of patients. Um, I worked with another veterinarian who was a man, and we graduated about the same time, had about the same amount of experience, and I found out after the fact that he, his contract, the way he was hired, he, he, got, he was offered a higher salary than me by about $20,000, and he only uh, had, and he had to... Part of his contract said he had to work fewer days than I did so over got, a two-week period. So he <laughs> I had only paid. had to work four days per week, and I had to work five days per week, and and he got paid more, even though we had similar experience. So I'm just clarifying. He got paid more and worked less. Yep. And this is yeah. recent. This is in the past few years because you've only been working five years. Yeah, so that this was, is I very found that prominent. Like two, two years ago. <laughs> And so the thing is, you would never know because our our salaries were not disclosed. Correct. Right. 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 And now I work for the government, and so there, the the salary is set. It's like there's a a scale, a pay scale. Like you can go and look online for anybody who works in the federal government to see what their job is and, and what level of pay they would get based on the grade step level that they are when they join the agency, when they join the government. And, um, you know, everybody, we all know what, like, for, for veterinarians going into the agency that I'm in, you go in as a grade step level 11 or 12, either one, depending on the job that you get. And everybody can see online, you know, the salary that you take home. And so it's kind of hard to discriminate as much when it's kind of just automated and set and everybody knows what it is. So that's something that I've heard that can help is being is encouraging people sharing what their their income is and not being so secret about it. Yeah, that's kind of hard. I mean, I know people who work at McDonald's. They don't want to tell anybody what they make. <laughs> it's going to be harder when you're a doctor. But, yeah, so, but if, the, if the whole team knows what each other is making, then we can work together to try to lobby for us all to be paid fairly. And people in, in positions of privilege who are getting paid more 
can band together with people who are getting paid less to try to um, get the powers to be to increase the salary for everybody, or at least make it more even. Uh, that, that completely makes sense to me. Um, you know, you've, you've shared a lot of information. What would you say is the hardest thing about being a veterinarian for you? Or what has been the hardest thing for you as a veterinarian? Mm, that's a good question. That's a good question. So people become veterinarians. Veterinarians become veterinarians because they're passionate about wanting to help. They either want to help the animals or the pet owners or the farmers or help protect the food supply. Or uh, there are veterinarians who do research, uh, finding out, I mean, uh, inventing vaccines for all the diseases that we get, like the flu vaccine. That's usually a veterinarian uh, collaborating with other health professionals to study those flu viruses that we get from other animals. Um, to create the vaccines. So whether it's a research veterinarian like that or um, veterinarians who work in the military, etc. It's the kind of job that is very demanding and uh, you do it because you're passionate about it and, and, you, and you just basically want to help. So the hardest thing I find when you're doing something that you're so passionate about is finding balance in your life and learning to say no (laughs) when you know you you can't save everyone you can't help everyone so um veterinarians have a hard time taking the time they need to take care take care of themselves and stop helping others and so you know we have to be healthy first to be able to help others and so it's important for veterinarians to take the time to uh, step away from their job for a while, try to get what's called a work-life balance, which is different for everybody. Spend time with your family, with your friends, um, and give yourself your own mental relaxation to step away. Yes, definitely have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today and talking about your profession. Before we let you go, though, um, I know there's listeners out there who are thinking about becoming veterinarians. Uh, what would you say to people um, who want to become veterinarians? What would your words of wisdom be? If you'd like to become a veterinarian, I would recommend trying to get some experience with veterinarians. If you walk into most veterinary clinics or go to an animal shelter or um, go to the zoo and start talking to people, express your interest, you should be able to find veterinarians who would be willing to let you shadow because not too many people um, take the time to figure out exactly what veterinarians are doing and so when uh, young people are interested in finding out about it, a lot of veterinarians are happy to, to have you shadow and, or even just interview and, and ask questions, and they'll, they'll talk to you for a long time about it, just like I'm doing here. <laughs> so, okay. so, yeah, so work on that, um, meeting other veterinarians, getting experience around animals, and... Um, Yeah, I mean, that's a place to start, definitely. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for joining us and being with us. Um, I know you help a lot of people with the information you've given, and we appreciate you just sharing your experiences. Happy to be here. Thank you. That was Dr. Kara Williams. Got to thank her again for being on the show. We'll see you next week. Peace out. Variety Weekly News Podcast.